Okay, so welcome everyone to this uh, second part on the introduction uh, to IPEPS. So yesterday we talked about the IPEPS ansatz and about different uh, contraction methods. And today we are mostly going to focus on the optimization methods in IPEPS. So that is uh, imaginary time evolution algorithms and then it will also tell you about uh, a newer uh, variational optimization scheme. Then I will also uh, uh, discuss a bit about the computational cost and so show you some additional benchmarks with IPEPS. And I will also show you a comparison with uh, 2D DMRG. Um, and then finally, I will also show you some applications where I will also discuss uh, a few results and the way I should read them and uh, something like that. And before I then come to an outlook and uh, the summer. Okay, so let's uh, continue with the optimization. Right. So yesterday we talked about uh, these three steps here when you do ground state calculations. So you start from a tensor network ansatz, which is a variational ansatz, and kind of the next step to do is to actually find uh, the best the variational parameters that you have the best approximation to some ground state of a given Hamiltonian. Okay, now in the past, this has usually been done for IPEPS using an imaginary time evolution. So that's the thing which I'm going to start with. So the idea of the imaginary time evolution is that we want to apply exponential of minus beta h onto some initial uh, wave function. And for beta going to infinity, this will project us onto the ground state. Right? And then uh, typically, we can't just uh, express this operator directly, but we want to decompose it into small pieces by doing a Trotter Suzuki decomposition. So we write uh, here the sum of nearest neighbor Hamiltonian terms uh, in the end as a product of Hamiltonian terms by introducing a small time step tau is equals to beta divided by n. So here split it into n uh, time steps. And then if tau is small, then we can approximate the exponential of this sum here as the product of the exponentials. <coughs> so what this boils down in the end is that we have these two body operators here, which we want to apply onto our tensor network. And this then performs an imaginary time evolution, and we want to represent the resulting state again as a tensor network. Right? So in one dimension, we would start from such a matrix product state, and then apply these two body <coughs> operators between e each nearest neighbor pairs here in the matrix product state and then represent the time evolved state again as a matrix product state. So I guess that's something which you have seen already uh, during this workshop, right? So the way one of the single step would work is that we apply this two body gate onto our uh, MPS tensors, multiply everything together, and then perform a singular value decomposition where we split this big tensor again into, into pieces as shown here. But now typically such a two-body operator would increase the bond dimension in between these two tensors. So we have an enlarged bond dimension here which we want to truncate. And in one dimension all we need to do is just to keep the, single the, the states with largest singular values here. Okay. And then eventually we can absorb the single values, uh, for example, on the left and the right side. Okay, so this is known as the uh, TBD algorithm, so time evolving block decimation. And uh, one side remark here is that if you do this truncation, you have to make sure that your MPS is actually in, in a canonical form with respect to this bond. Because if it's in a canonical form, then doing this SVD really corresponds to doing a Schmidt decomposition, and then you can think of these singular values as your Schmidt coefficients, and then we know the best approximation we can do of our wave function is to keep uh, the, the, the largest Schmidt values. Okay, so that's the idea, and that's now the same thing we now want to do also in two dimensions, right? So we have these two body operators, we, want, we would like to apply it to our PEPS or IPEPS wave function, this will increase the bond dimension, and then we have to truncate this bond uh, back to the original bond dimension. So we want to do really the, the same thing, but the problem is now that using an SVD type update is no longer optimal. 
And the reason for that is that uh, we have loops in the ansatz. So for example, when we want to truncate this bond here, or when we cut the bond, then we don't split the system into two pieces as in one dimension. So we can no longer think of cutting a bond as performing a Schmidt decomposition, and in the end using an SVD type update is no longer justified. So it's no longer the optimal uh, truncation you can do. But nevertheless, you can still use uh, such a type of uh, optimization. And the advantage is really that it's computationally very cheap because it, ju it just involves a few local tensors, right? Uh, so that's called uh, the simple update. And in the end, it actually works uh, amazingly well in the sense that you can still get uh, quite accurate results, for example, for the energy or it can also reproduce, uh, depending on the state, it can give you uh, qualitatively the right state. So typically, you will see that, for example, order parameters are, are uh, overestimated uh, with this method. I will show you some data later. Okay, so the advantage is really it's, it's very cheap, but it's not really uh, an optimal truncation. If you want to do an optimal truncation, you have to use uh, <coughs> what is called uh, the full update. So where you really take into account the entire 2D wave function to optimize a single bond. So this is optimal for a truncation of one bond, but it's computationally also much more expensive because to optimize a bond, you first have to contract the infinite 2D wave function. And of course, if you have to do this at every single time step, and you have to do thousands of time steps, then this becomes computationally very expensive because in the end, the contraction of the 2D network is really the expensive part. Okay, so it's computationally more expensive, but it's, uh, it's, it's optimal. And then there are kind of uh, improvements of the full update, so so-called fast full update, which in the end is just about recycling as much as possible from the, from the previous step. So you don't contract your uh, network from scratch, but you reuse the environment from the from the previous day. So I will explain these things in, in more detail uh, in the following. Let me mention there also there's another way to do the optimization, which uh, is something in between, <coughs> so-called uh, cluster updates, where you're not contracting the entire 2D wave function to optimize a bond, but you just consider a small cluster in your system. Okay, so let me explain you the, the simple update, which in the end really works in the same way as uh, ITBD in one dimension. So I'm not sure if you have seen ITBD uh, for, for matrix product states during this workshop, but the way it works is that first you represent your tensor network in a slightly different form. Namely, instead of just having tensors here on the, on the vertices, you also have these lambdas here, which are diagonal matrices which in the end contain the singular values. And um, so you can always go from this representation here back to this representation simply by uh, absorbing these singular values here in the vertices and that's how you get uh, A back here for example. Mm -hmm. So the simple update really works like ITVD in one dimension meaning that we have these two tensors here we apply a two-body operator onto these two tensors. And then what we do is to include also all the surrounding weights that we have here. And the reason for that is that in one dimension, if you include these weights, it will automatically bring your wave function into a canonical form with respect to this bond here. Okay? Now in two dimensions, there's no canonical form. So this is not really true. But nevertheless, it gives you some sort of quasi-canonical form, or it would be a canonical form if there were no loops in the ansatz. So it's, it's like doing the approximation that you neglect the loops uh, in your ansatz. And um, so you include everything here, and then you do an SVD, you uh, pull things apart again, you get this new weights lambda 1 uh, tilde, and then in the end you take out these weights uh, on the side here, you take them out again, so they're not going to be changed, right? So you can take them out again, for example, by just multiplying uh, the inverse of these weights to this uh, resulting tensor here, and here the inverse of the weights to the resulting uh, tensor here. It should be a, a gamma tilde. So. 
okay, and we just keep the d largest singular values, and this is how we get <coughs> a, a truncation of the bond in a very cheap way. Now, actually, we can do this even cheaper, right? So let me show you how you can do this even cheaper, which is a trick which is often used in uh, 2D tensor network algorithms. Namely, uh, we want to update this bond here, but what we can first do is actually split off the relevant parts of these two tensors which we actually want to update. Okay, so the idea is, so let's first absorb all these weights into, into, into the middle. So we have these uh, orange tensors here. And what we now first do is take this orange tensor and perform uh, an SVD, so an exact SVD. So we have here split it into a U and then S times V here. So you see we have split off a small tensor here from the orange one. And we do this now on both sides. So we do it on this side and on this side. And then we arrive at this tensor network here. Right? So this is really equal. Here we did not do any truncation. But now you see we can apply this two-body operator now. Instead of applying it to these two big tensors, we just apply it to these small tensors here. So we multiply everything together and then just do the SVD on the smaller tensor. Right? And th that's even cheaper than doing the SVD on this, on this bigger block here. OK, and then we do the same as before. So we do the SVD, we get the new weights here and update the tensors, and then eventually we extract again the weights which we have included up here, which uh, have not been uh, changed in this step. OK, so this is the simple update. Okay, if there are no questions about that, then I would move to the full update. So now what I show you here, we do the same thing again. So we have this two-body operator <coughs> applied to these two tensors, A and B. But now I connect these two tensors really to the infinite 2D wave function surrounding these two tensors. So what I call here the environment uh, is really the rest of the IPEPs surrounding these two tensors. Right? So it's just uh, denoted in a simplified way. Okay, so then we can call Psi, the initial IPEPs, we apply G to Psi, and then the time evolved state we denote by Psi tilde. Right? And again, uh, this Psi tilde will have an enlarged bond dimension between A and B. And the goal is now to approximate this Psi tilde by a Psi prime, where we have truncated this enlarged bond dimension, so which got enlarged here, we truncated it down to a D again. Right? So we try to find the best tensors A prime and B prime to have the best approximation to this uh, A, B with G applied. So what we want to do is really to minimize the norm distance between these two wave functions, right? So psi tilde minus pi prime uh, to the square, which uh, is equals to uh, this expression here. So we have all these uh, overlaps here. And in order to compute this, so this is our cost function which we want to minimize. And then you see, if you want to compute this, we really have to take the overlap of the entire wave functions, meaning we have to contract the infinite 2D wave functions uh, corresponding to these, um, to these overlaps here. OK, so this defines as a cost function. And we can now minimize this cost function in, in different ways. So it's just a minimization problem. This can be done in an iterative way or with a conjugate gradient, with a Newton method, uh, and so on. And I will show you on the next slide how we can do it in an, in an iterative way. Okay, but what is really important to understand is now that for the truncation here, we really take the entire 2D wave function into account to optimize a bond. Okay, <coughs> which means that we first have to actually contract the 2D wave function and this is why this full update is uh, computationally expensive. Okay, so let me explain how we can do this uh, iterative optimization. <coughs> and the first step, again, is that we split off the relevant part that we would like to update. Right? So we have our tensor A here. We do, again, uh, an SVD where we split off this P tensor uh, from 
from A. So we have a x times P is equals to A. And for the B tensor, we do the same thing. So, and again, the advantage is that the things we want to optimize, this P and Q, are smaller than the initial uh, A and B here. And then we construct uh, the environment surrounding these uh, P and Q tensors, right? So it's the same environment as we had before, but now I also absorb these uh, X and Y tensors. I add them to the environment, meaning that what I show you here, when we add here P and Q and P dagger Q dagger, then this is just the norm of the IPEPs. So, right? so this is really the norm of the IPEPs except uh, these P and Q tensors. And these are really the small pieces which we want to update uh, in, in, this, uh, in this time evolution step. Okay, so meaning that, um, again, we have a psi tilde uh, depending on the old uh, PQ where G is applied and we want to find new P prime, Q prime, which gives us the best approximation of this time evolved uh, state. Right? So again, we want to minimize this cost function. So that's what I showed you before. It's this expression here. And now let's, uh, we can write down the tensor network diagrams of all these terms here. Uh, so let's do that. And then you will see that all these four diagrams here have actually the same environment, right? So this environment is the same for all these terms here because all that changes are the things uh, which happen locally between P and Q, okay? So psi tilde, we said, is just P and Q with the gate G applied, right? So this is the ket, and then here we have the same on the bra level. So this is really the diagram of this psi tilde, uh, um, psi tilde. Then here we have psi prime, psi prime, and psi prime is just the, uh, the thing we want to obtain, so <coughs> PQ, P prime, Q prime, and then also the same in the bra level. And then here we have the, the mixed terms here, so with uh, C prime here and C tilde here, and that's the, uh, the other term. Okay, so this is the, our cost function which we want to minimize. And now one way to minimize it is to do it in an iterative way. So we have this cost function. We can first minimize it with respect to, to a PQ. So we can keep Q, Q prime fixed and then find the optimal new P, P prime. And then we keep P prime fixed and find the optimal Q prime and we reiterate back and forth until we have minimized this cost function. Okay, so let's uh, go through this. We can get an initial guess for our P prime and Q primes by just doing an SVD, right? So this is similar to a simple update, but here we only use this as an initial starting point for the full update, okay? So this is our initial guess for the P prime and Q prime. And now we're going to keep the Q prime fixed and optimize this cost function with respect to P prime. So we take the derivative of the cost function with respect to P prime and set it to zero. Okay, so that's the cost function we want to minimize. We uh, take the derivative with, with respect to P prime. Uh, here we take with respect to the conjugate. And taking the, the derivative of a tensor network, that's probably something I've seen, is just taking out the tensor from the network. Okay, so that's what we end up with, because here we have no dependence uh, on, the, on the P uh, conjugate. So this is what we obtain in the end. So this is equals to this. And if you look at the structure of this network, it's the following. Um, we can look at this diagram here and take out the P prime and write it as a matrix. So this network here, except the P prime, we can call M. So we have a matrix M times P prime is equals to a vector B here. So right, we obtain this vector simply by joining all these indices here and just make one, one index out of it. Okay, so the structure of this equation is nothing but a, a, a linear system of equations. So we solve this linear system with respect to P prime, which gives us then a new P prime. Okay. So what we have done is we have minimized our cost function with respect to P prime. We improved it. 
And now uh, we got a new p prime, and now we do the same thing with respect to q prime. So we minimize the cost function with respect to q prime. This gives us a new q, q prime, and then we reiterate this until we have reached convergence and we have minimized uh, this cost function. Okay, and then once we have found the optimal p prime and q prime, then we can get back the, the big tensor a prime and b prime by multiplying it back to this x here. So because, as you remember initially, we split the a into, into these two parts, so and the x is the thing which we have not updated. Uh, question. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to make sure. I mean, the splitting technique. I, I mean, by by doing that, uh, we don't lose anything. In principle, we should not uh, lose anything because we do we do here an exact uh, uh, SVD. So we don't don't truncate there. I mean, we don't uh, I mean, truncate the, the dimension there. No, we don't. We don't truncate there anything. Okay. We don't, we don't truncate there anything. So in the end, uh, it's really a way how to reduce the cost. But in the end, it would actually be interesting to, to do a direct comparison without uh -huh. splitting it off. Uh -huh. So uh, I, I have not, I, I never, uh, I have not made uh -huh. a direct comparison in the oh, end. Maybe there's a, a slight improvement. But in the end, so I, I'm just saying that he, this is computationally much more cheaper. That's right. why it's really uh, right. useful to do it. So that's right. Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, this is uh, less accurate than you optimize the full So it's the same accuracy you say? No, it's uh, less accurate. It's less accurate, you say? Yes. Okay. And this, uh, how, uh, how big is it? It depends on what cost this is. It depends on uh, how big it is, uh, just uh, the bit you have applied. So generally, because uh, if you have a full tensor, then you have more parameter can be adjusted. That's right. right. So now you have fewer. You have you have fewer tensors. So but so in the end, uh, the splitting you made did not. I mean, there's no truncation involved. But you say you have more parameters to optimize the cost function. Yeah. But in this case, you truncate less, right? Because uh, after the QR decomposition, the SVD part, you actually you, you throw away less states because of because of the, the, the dimension is actually smaller. No, it's the same. It's the same dimension, right? I mean, here I, you don't. No, no, but the so SVD is is is, a, is, a, is less expensive than full tensor. That's right. But here we do, we we keep the, the bond dimension we keep here is not d, but this is d times the physical. No, no, dimension. I'm not saying this part. I'm, not, I'm saying that during this uh, this truncation part, actually, you throw away less states. In, in which both? in which truncation part? Because you, you just do a, a small d, large d uh -huh. matrix, so basically d d squared. Yes. So this right? is. But if you do if you have full tensor, you have a. You have d more. D you have more parameters, parameters that you can adjust. All the way more because you only keep d. You, you can you can right. So but I mean the so truncation in the end this uh, you trunk I mean. The final bond dimension is the same, but you have more. You would have more variation. Param I mean, more parameters to reduce the cost function. But it's uh, yeah, it would be actually interesting to see. Here the so yeah. But then again, the gate only alters a subset yeah. of the available parameters. Exactly. Yeah. So it doesn't it, it doesn't give you anything if you take into account the other legs that are not even touched by the gate. This is just some additional work that doesn't give. So you anything. Exa So in the end, if if you wouldn't do any truncation, then this would be yeah. exactly the same thing as not doing the splitting, but the argument was that when reducing the cost function, then who knows, maybe by including the parameters from the bigger tensors that you might well, you get it a bit lower, but I'm not, I'm not in time. Because if it's unitary, it really just affects something. Yes, mm. that's if right. Yeah. The correct gauge. Yes. But that's that's right. Yeah. So I think okay. Anyway, so I mean, in the end, this is uh, in the end, this kind of makes the, the scheme. Uh, it's, it's a way how to save also. Um, I think it makes it more stable. We test it, so makes it more stable. Yeah, at least for one D. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. All right. Also in two D, I D, D, D. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's the that's the full update again. Uh, this then 
this gives you a, an optimal truncation of this uh, particular bond here. But again, because you have to compute this environment, this is uh, computationally more expensive. But you can, of course, gain quite a bit if you recycle the previous environment and don't compute these environments always from scratch, right? So you can do, uh, by <coughs> using such tricks, you can also make the full update actually also uh, computationally uh, useful in the end, that you can really use it as an optimization method. Okay, so we have these two schemes and let me just show you one example for the 2D Heisenberg model uh, here for the stagnant magnetization. Here we have the exact uh, Monte Carlo result and then you see here we have the simple update results. So here we can easily go to very, very large uh, bond dimensions. But you see it starts to flatten out here and the order parameter is uh, overestimated. Whereas in the full update you see we approach the, the exact result. Right. And then in the end, of course, you can also combine the two. So you can start with a simple update to get an initial state and then use the full update for a further optimization. And then again, uh, as mentioned before, you can try to recycle as much as possible, which uh, can also be called a fast full update. Okay, so these are the imaginary time evolution schemes. Are there still more questions about that? Yes? Uh, how do you choose the uh, uh, imaginary time step? I would start from a, from a large step and then reduce it, uh, make it smaller and smaller. So what's the, smaller, the smallest value? So I use a, a second order trotter uh, thing, and then, but then it depends also, I mean I would look how quantities behave as a function of delta tau, but usually uh, so that's model dependent, but typically I, I don't go. I, I go down maybe to uh, 0 0.001 or something. So 10 to the minus 3. Yeah. But I mean, this really depends on you know if I do a transverse easing model, and if I'm very close to convergence, then the trotter error will start playing a role. If I do a T-chain Hubbard model where the biggest error really comes from the bond dimension, then the trotter error doesn't really matter, and I would not go to this small delta tau. So then I would stop at. Uh, 0 0.01 or something like this, right? Because the, the error in the D is so much worse than the trotter error, so then we don't care so much about the trotter error. Mm -hmm. Yes, a technical question. Mm -hmm. So uh, about this uh, stability of this iterative scheme, because sometimes that you you get uh, the whole uh, there become become a negative value, and uh, basically the whole thing just breaks down, break, uh, breaks down, right? Yes, yeah, so okay, so again, this is actually, it's interesting that um, so there are also ways to do uh, some, some gauge fixing and, and trying to improve the stability. It all, this is also strongly model dependent. Mm -hmm. And actually, the simpler models, uh, you can get more instability problems than highly entangled systems, because typically this is related to the fact that, for example, if you look at spectra, spectra of single values, if they're very uh, fastly decaying, then you, this, can, this, can, this can lead to instability problems. If you take a highly entangled system, things are, the spectra are kind of more compact and this typically, so typically have less uh, problems there. So, for example, in the Heisenberg model, what I've observed is that if I do a full update, um, a full update for bond dimensions larger than six, that I can get instability problems by doing this iterative procedure. But if I use a conjugate gradient scheme to optimize P prime and Q prime directly, then I don't have uh, this, this kind of helps okay. to. Because the landscape becomes like a more complicated. It, because of right, the right. more parameters. Right, right. Yeah, more parameters, but it also depends on the, it really also depends on the, um, how to say, uh, what, I, what I mentioned before, if you look at, the spectra as if they really stretch over many orders of magnitude. Mm -hmm. I can easily go to a more entangled system and have much larger bond dimensions, but somehow I, I don't run into uh, this problem. This case. So if you would use higher precision calculations, uh, then probably you will not enter into these problems as well. Mm -hmm. Yes? So in that uh, uh, scheme that you were using here to invert and not at some point, 
It's it, well, it's solving the the it's linear system. Yes, you can see this inversion. Do you have to invert something or not? No, no. Right, exactly. So it's, it, it's exactly. It's, it's and, but there's also ways how to you know improve the condition number and these things. So there there are several tricks uh, you can find. So that's okay. So then let me move to the variational optimization. And let me first explain the idea for PEPs, which is somehow easier, right? So if you take a finite PEPs, then all the tenses are different in your ansatz. So that's like in a finite uh, DMRG calculation with a finite matrix product state. And then the variational optimization here really becomes uh, the same as in a one-side update for matrix product states. Namely, what we want to do is to sweep over all the tenses in our ansatz and then always minimize the energy with respect to a tensor while we keep all the other tensors fixed. Right? So we go really iteratively through all the tenses in our ansatz and do such an iterative optimization. Right? So we could start with a tensor A here and then we want to optimize this tensor A with respect to the energy and uh, keep the others fixed. So we have the energy here we want to minimize it with respect to this A, and if you <coughs> take the derivative with respect to A, you can show that this boils down to solving a, a generalized eigenvalue problem of this form here. So where this X here corresponds to the vector uh, obtained by reshaping tensor A uh, as a vector, then N here is the tensor network from the norm terms and this H here is the tensor network including all Hamiltonian terms. Okay, now let me show you what I mean by these expressions just in one dimension, which is kind of easier to see. So this N term here corresponds to this network here where we have removed A and A dagger. Right, that's the thing for N, and then we can reshape this network as a matrix. <coughs> and then the H term is this thing here, so we have the Hamiltonian here, which of course can also be represented as an MPO, and then we also remove A and A dagger here. Okay, so we have to solve this generalized eigenvalue problem for the smallest energy eigenvalue, and this will then give us a new tensor A, A prime, which we then can put back into our, into our ansatz, and then we move to the next tensor and optimize this one, and while keeping all the others fixed, and then we really go iteratively uh, through the entire lattice several times until the energy has reached convergence. Okay, so this is the uh, usual variational optimization uh, which has already been done for PEPs uh, some time ago. Now, if you do a variational optimization for infinite PEPs, there are additional challenges, right? So the the challenge is that now we have infinitely many Hamiltonian terms which have to be taken into account. So this H here really contains an infinite sum of Hamiltonian terms. Now we'll, I will show you one way how to take these Hamiltonian terms into account uh, based on the corner transfer matrix method. But that's not the only way to do it. So uh, recently there has been a, a new framework uh, introduced in Frank Festratis group on the so-called channel environments. So that's a very new, uh, that's a very nice uh, framework where you can also do these sorts of uh, summation of uh, Hamiltonian terms. And of course, uh, something more straightforward would be to represent the Hamiltonian as a PEPO. So a PEPO is a 2D generalization of a matrix product operator, right? So I guess you have seen that you can represent a Hamiltonian in 1D as a matrix product operator. And now in 2D you can do something very similar. You can come up with a PEPO representation of your Hamiltonian. And then all you need to do uh, would be to uh, contract uh, the three layer network of KET, PEPO, and BRA uh, PEPS tensor network. So I, I have tried this out, but this is, uh, seems to me computationally more expensive than uh, these two other uh, options here. And of course, if you use a PEPO, and if you have this three-layer thing, then this is very similar to what has been done uh, by also Nishino and co-workers in the context of 3D classical systems, where they do a variational optimization 
uh, where they uh, maximize the the, um, the partition function, right? So this type of uh, variational optimization has already been done in this context uh, quite some time ago. Okay, so this is the first challenge in the infinite case. The second challenge is that now each tensor actually appears infinitely many times, right? In the finite peps, each tensor only appeared once in the ansatz, but now when we have a unit cell of tensors, then we have this A tensor appearing here, 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 so infinitely many times which in the end means that this um, energy here does not depend on A only in a, a bilinear way, but it's actually a highly nonlinear problem, right? Which means that in the end we cannot just solve this generalized eigenvalue problem for A and get the optimal solution, right? Because A appears uh, several times. Now, also here there are different uh, ways how to deal with this and so I made good experience with uh, a scheme where I just take an adaptive linear combination between the solution from this generalized eigenvalue problem, so this A prime I obtain here, and the old tensor. So I will, I will explain these two things in more detail uh, in the following. But also here there are different approaches. So instead of doing, instead of solving a generalized diagonal problem, you could also use a conjugate gradient approach to minimize this energy in a, in a more direct way. Okay, so there's really many options one can, uh, how one can do an energy minimization. Now let me comment on how to do this um, summation of energy terms with the CTM method. Okay, uh, so what we, we have seen the CTM method uh, already uh, yesterday, so we know that this N term here is nothing but this environment here. And we have seen yesterday how to compute uh, this environment with the CTM. But the question is now, how about this uh, H term here? And the idea is now to do something very similar, namely we introduce new uh, environment tensors which also in include Hamiltonian terms. So here would be one of these um, environment, new environment tensors, uh, C1 tilde, and C1 tilde in the end corresponds to um, the upper left infinite system where we take the sum over all Hamiltonian terms, so the Hamiltonian terms on each, uh, between each nearest neighbor pairs in this upper left infinite corner. Okay, so this would be all Hamiltonian contributions of this H here living in this upper left corner here. But of course these are not all uh, Hamiltonian terms which we have to include but there are more, so the Hamiltonian terms can be in this corner, or in this corner, or in this corner, and this corner, so we sum over all these contributions. But then the Hamiltonian terms can also live here on these edges, so these blue tenses here correspond to this sum here, so where the Hamiltonian contributions can be uh, on, the, on these sides, on the edges, then we also have Hamiltonian contributions which live between the corner and the edge here. So either on the, in the horizontal direction or in the vertical direction. And here is schematically what, what these terms are, right? So we have Hamiltonian terms between a corner here and an edge here. And again, we just take this summation. And eventually we also have the local terms, so Hamiltonian terms between the edge and the middle of the system. Now you can convince yourself that what is shown here in the end are really all infinite Hamiltonian terms in this um, in this uh, expectation value. Okay. So this uh, Hamiltonian you apply is always this uh, this, uh, this uh, original case, it's not renormalized in any way. No, this is really the two-body Hamiltonian okay. term. Yes. Okay. The question is now. Uh, so this is what, what we want to obtain, and now we want to compute these uh, blue tensors. And this can be done uh, also using the corner transfer matrix method. And in the end, this is all about doing the right bookkeeping. <coughs> so keeping account of all these terms when we do, for example, a left move with the CTM. Right? So again, uh, remember we discussed about the left move where we just add a new row into our system 
and then absorb this new row onto the left edge um, of our environment. So here I show you all relevant diagrams that you need to do uh, for such a left move and how you have to update all these uh, contributions. Okay, so I will not really go through, through all this, but I mean, just uh, look at this example here. So the new updated corner tilde tensor consists of these three contributions, right? Because the Hamiltonian terms can be in the previous corner or in this edge here on the new row, which we introduce, or they can be in between the two, right? So by adding up these three contributions, they add to the kind of the new uh, corner term. Okay, so by doing this, of course, also for the right move, top move, and down move, we can then sum up all these Hamiltonian terms in an iterative way in the corner transfer matrix uh, method. Um, how can you possibly debug your program? <laughs> is this procedure is this uh, complicated? Uh, so there are, there are actually ways, right? So what you can do is, uh, this is a summation of terms. Right. So what you can do is simply, instead of adding a Hamiltonian term, you can add identities. So each oh. identity will add one to it. And then oh. after a few steps, you can actually check that you have added oh, the correct number of identities, right, oh. for example. And you can also check these things individually. So you can um, just do left moves and check if, uh, if all the contributions are there. Uh -huh. Or you can combine a left move and top move, and then you uh, so you can, you can you should think of how many terms should be included, and that, that's the way how you can check uh, if, uh, if if things are there. So there's, uh, it's true, it's uh, it's tricky uh, uh, to debug, but uh, you can do it in a systematic way, and I eventually. See. I see. Yeah. So for for each different corner, they have a different uh, truncation isometry. You have to calculate separately uh, No, oh yeah. So this is actually, so actually, this isometry, this projector, is the one obtained from contracting the norm. So we do the same renormalization. And that's actually important to keep uh, translation invariance of all these uh, uh, edge tensors. So that's a, that's a good point. So these yellow tensors are the ones which we computed from the uh, left move of the, of the norm tensor. OK, so this is one way. Again, this is, uh, this, there would be other ways to do it. Yes. Uh, have you subtract uh, some constant <coughs> in the Hamiltonian term so that uh, the uh, uh, CPM doesn't have, uh, contain a uh, large negative number? Mm, no. Since uh, you might uh, go, uh, how to say, uh, since the uh, number of Hamiltonian terms increase quadratically uh, <coughs> with respect to the size of the corner. Yes. So uh, if Okay, that's interesting. No, I did not uh, subtract anything, but that's. Uh, okay, what is the maximum size you have reached uh, in your calculus? So what, what is the uh, maximum number of iterations in your calculus? Uh, that's uh, uh, probably uh, well. That's yeah. That's I, I don't know. Well, I guess hundreds of steps or something. Up to several thousand is okay. Up to several thousands. Yeah. So probably it's not. Uh, Probably I went not beyond 10,000 or something or 1,000. Okay. So that's okay. It's interesting, but maybe we can discuss uh, later about but this. Taking the absolute, I mean, you normalize the, the, the tensor such that the, the absolute value of the, the element become one. That doesn't help. Mm -hmm. so you're talking about this, so no, no, exactly. So this is one of the, the things uh, we do to keep the numbers bounded. So if it's right. about this, then we, uh, I'm doing this here. Yeah, yes. That's for wave function. This is for energy. Yeah, no, but, no, but you, but you, you do the same. Get, right, because but you get, take a ratio at the end. Exactly. So this is, that's, that's exactly the same here, that uh, we keep the numbers bounded of the, of the corners. But 
you have to be consistent that if yes, you, yes. of course, if you divide the C1 tensor by, uh, by a certain factor, then you should also divide the corresponding C1 mm -hmm. tilde tensor by the same factor. Okay. All right, so that's, uh, that's in the end uh, the idea of this uh, summation. And now let me come uh, to this uh, second challenge and the, and the practical scheme. So right, if we now minimize uh, this generalized eigenvalue problem and we get a new A prime, then the solution, so it's called A tilde here, the solution of A, A tilde of this generalized eigenvalue problem is not necessarily the optimum, right? So this is the optimum just by optimizing one tensor in the middle, but it's not clear that this is going to be the optimal tensor if we copy it every, everywhere in our ensembles. Um, so instead, what we do here is to take a linear combination of the previous tensor and the new one. So this is just a linear combination which I wrote here with a sine and cosine of this uh, uh, parameter lambda, such that if I take lambda in this range here, I can do all linear combinations also with different signs, right? But in the end, this is just a linear combination of the, of the two tensors. And you see, our new uh, solution, A prime, will depend on this parameter lambda. And we can now do a second minimization with respect to this parameter lambda here. So we look for the optimal lambda which minimizes uh, this energy. And because this second minimization, um, you have to evaluate the energy for each uh, 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 value of lambda, so that's computationally also expensive, so we want to try to minimize the number of steps uh, we use here. And uh, in the end, especially at the beginning, it's not so important to really have the most optimal lambda, because anyway it's an iterative procedure. So we just try to do a few steps to find the suitable lambda which we are going to accept. Okay, and here is uh, one way how to do such a scheme. So we first compute the energy with lambda equals to 0 0.5, which in that case would be accepting the solution from the generalized eigenvalue problem. And if this lowers the actual energy, then we would accept this uh, new tensor. And if this is not lowering energy, then we try to do a small uh, step size. So we define some initial uh, delta here, for example, with 0 0.1 but this also might depend on the, on the model. And then we, uh, check, um, then we check for the sign if we have to actually take a positive or a negative lambda. So we check this by just looking at the energy uh, if this 1 plus h is uh, smaller or larger than uh, the energy of the previous solution. And then eventually we reiterate, so we try to look for the best lambda here by adjusting this uh, step size uh, lambda. And uh, whenever the energy is higher as at the previous one, we would reject the move and uh, decrease uh, delta by a factor two. And we do this until we have found a lambda which actually lowers the energy. Okay, so in the end, uh, you can do uh, many things here and the goal is to have a scheme which in the end lowers the energy, so which finds some good uh, mixing parameter here. But in the end, you can also do just a standard minimization. Uh, so far, this is necessary. Can you go back one slide? So far, this is why the original y is not optimal. optimal. Uh, you see, uh, we solved this generalized eigenvalue yes. problem for one new tensor in the middle, yes. right? And this is going to give us the best new wave function. Uh, so imagine if you, if you just have a one-side unit cell, yeah. right? This is going to give us the best wave function made of A, 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 A everywhere yeah. with one single new tensor A prime in the middle. Uh, this is going to be the optimum for this new ansatz. Yes. But our final new ansatz is going to be to replace this A prime everywhere, right? Our new ansatz is going uh, to consist of A, A, A prime, A prime, uh, repeated, yeah. but this is not what we minimize here, right? So that's. Uh, uh, so supposedly, if you reach a fixed point, there will be no difference. Uh, it's the actually it's not uh, it, it's not the case. So it's uh, you, you might think that this would happen, but actually, if you minimize further, it's not it's not really. 
So it, it depends a bit, but in practice, uh, it's it's not so what happens. But I understand what you mean. Yeah. Isn't this also a problem in the full update scheme, where we also like optimize a single tensor plot in the middle? That's that's true. Exactly. That's true. And this might be one of the reasons exactly why the full update fails to give the optimal solution. So probably one would need to do something similar in the full update, but this would be crazy because you would need to do this then for every tiny uh, step, right? Because in the variational optimization, we only need to do a few steps and not thousands of steps as in the imaginary time evolution. In the full update, don't you do imaginary time evolution? Yes. So but you basically are doing a very small change. Yeah. That's right. So it's also less severe. It's also less severe, exactly. But you could also, instead of just solving this uh, generalist eigenvalue problem, you, what you're basically uh, calculating is something like the gradient. Exactly, yes. You can just use this for a exactly. gradient descent. So. Exactly, that's what uh, Lawrence uh, van der Straat yeah, has yeah, been yeah. working on. So you can also uh, compute the gradient based on that. So that's uh, essentially this here uh, is, uh, corresponds to the gradient if you multiply it with a dagger. <laughs> And then you can do a conjugate gradient scheme. So my impression is that the conjugate gradient scheme will particularly be useful for a one-side unit cell, whereas what I'm doing here works better and better if your unit cell size become large because the, the individual tensors then feel less from the neighboring tensors. So it's uh, so in the end, this this then becomes more like the finite PEPs uh, optimization, and this also converges uh, pretty quickly in the end. Okay, so then, uh, so then once we have found the new solution, then we really put it back into unit cell and move to the next tensor and really reiterate it over all these, uh, over all these tensors. Okay, so let me show you uh, some results. I showed this already on, uh, on Monday, so I will not uh, make, take too much time. But uh, so again, here you see the energy, the, the relative energy of the energy per side relative error of the energy per side of the Heisenberg model, and then you really see the difference between simple update, full update, and variational update. And you can see that even the full update fails to provide the most accurate solution, and we can further uh, improve it with this uh, variational optimization. So here for the energy, and here also for uh, order parameters. And then again, as mentioned on Monday, we get even a better result when we take tau uh, to zero in the imaginary time evolution. So there's still a difference uh, between the full update and the variational optimization. And then also uh, computation-wise, I mean, one single step with the variational optimization is more expensive than the imaginary time evolution, but we also need to do less, uh, uh, much fewer steps. So this is imaginary time evolution, and this always corresponds to 30 steps. So 30 imaginary time evolution steps, and these are single steps with the variational optimization. And you see we, we obtain uh, quite a, a quick convergence here. Here starting from the same uh, simple update. Uh, so I showed you that on Monday. Let me show, show you one further example, because I told you about the shastri sutherland model. Uh, yesterday, and actually one of the uh, challenging things in the shastri sutherland model was to converge to this Plackett state here, which exists if you don't have an external magnetic field. And in the full update, uh, I observed that if you start from the wrong state, so this uh, nil state here, and you would evolve it, you would actually end up also in a nil state, so it would fail to enter into this Plackett state. But if I start from the same initial state and do a variational optimization, then I really uh, get into this, uh, this Plackett state here. So which in the end also shows that somehow the variational optimization can better overcome some, some uh, energy uh, barriers to get into the, the right state. And then uh, another example, also in the context of the shastri sutherland model. So here I uh, applied this variational optimization also to larger unit cell sizes. So that was for a 4 times 4 unit cell. 
And I told you yesterday that we get this uh, bound state object of triplets. And now the thing is, if you use a bad optimization scheme, then you can actually see that the, the symmetry of this bound state is not nicely reproduced. So that's a result from the simple update. Uh, and you see it doesn't have the right symmetries as it should have uh, as shown here, right? So these bound state objects have a rotational symmetry. Okay, so uh, what I show you here is a benchmark showing this symmetry error as a function of the bond dimension. And this symmetry error measures the deviation of the result from a symmetric state. So in the end, what I do is I look at the standard deviation of the spins which should be equivalent uh, uh, by symmetry. And then you can see here that the simple update really gives you a, a large error. Uh, so it really doesn't reproduce the symmetry nicely. The full update really improves a lot on this, but then again with the variation optimization, we obtain an even better result, right? which in the end shows that it also helps really to improve uh, the quality of uh, order parameters. Okay, so I told you about uh, different optimization schemes, right? Like the simple update is really useful because it's computationally cheap, but it's not uh, fully accurate. Then with the full update and fast full update, you can really obtain a higher accuracy, but it's more expensive than the simple update. And then it turns out by doing an energy minimization or a variation optimization, you can really get a, a higher accuracy with a similar computational cost as in the, as in the full update. And it's, uh, re let me really emphasize that what I showed you here is not the only way how we can do an energy minimization. So again, there has been this recent work also in, in Frank Festratis group based on these channel environments. So that's another way how to do the summation of Hamiltonian terms and then eventually they use a conjugate gradient approach uh, to do the, uh, the energy minimization. Right, so I really think there's more things to explore here. So that might not be the end of the story, but it's really worthwhile to try out new things, which in the end might help to even further improve the poor performance of these optimization methods. Because this in the end is really the true bottleneck in the, in the simulation, so we can, we can improve this, that's really, uh, that's really great. And of course, yes, uh, so variation optimization, that's in, in the end not a completely new thing, but I mean, that has been used already a long time ago uh, for 3D classical models. Okay, so with this... Then, uh, uh, could you explain uh, why uh, the update stack on some... Uh, the update depends on some initial states, but uh, this uh, variational optimization method uh, don't depend on the initial state for uh, the specific model. Yeah, so I mean, there, 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 seem, there must be reasons why the full update fails to give you the optimal state. And I, I tried already, on, uh, there was already a question on Monday, and probably one of the main reasons is that we only do an optimal truncation in the middle of our system for one single bond. But the true optimization we would need to do is to first take the wave function where we have increased this bond dimension everywhere and then do a global optimization where we uh, truncate this bond everywhere simultaneously. And this is not what we do here, and this might be one of the reasons why the full update does not give you the, the full accuracy. So does it mean that uh, even if you start from the optimal solution obtained by the uh, better method, I mean variation optimization, for example, and apply the full update? It would, it would actually go away from the optimal solution, so the energy would increase in that case. I see. I see. So it's not just a problem of local minima or anything like that. It's not only a problem of uh, local minima in the sense, but, but again, because you, uh, so you can imagine, you, you do this local optimization, right? So it's not a, a global optimization, so it can also bring you away from the, from the global optimal solution, right? So it's not, it's not like a, something like a fixed point that you can stay inside. I see. But that's, uh, yeah, so that's mm -hmm. one of the, Issues, yeah? So if you use the same scheme uh, as in version of optimization that is uh, to compare the global change of all tensors, the energy, and in the full update, do you, do you say that it will give the 
same energy from co-update and the version optimization? Uh, so you mean in the version optimization, you update one tensor and then uh, then change everywhere tensors and then compare the energy. If the energy goes higher, then you use some combination. Oh uh, no, no, no. So uh, so actually, if you do that, mm -hmm. the scheme. So for small bond dimension, this will work well. Mm -hmm. But if you go to larger bond dimensions, then the actual algorithm is even not stable. So it's so because the the solution you put in really screws up your entire uh, wave function. So in the end, uh, it's you, you can't really compare the two uh, situations uh, directly. So, uh, so, yeah. so it's not only so doing the mixing is not only to actually give you a lower energy, but it's actually also important to keep the the, the method uh, stable because the, the solution really can be something which is which is not uh, which is not meaningful. So if we update, is it possible to do this uh, combination? Well, in principle, you could do it, right? You could really first time evolve. You do uh, imaginary time evolution gates on all neighboring bonds, and you would have increased your bond dimension. Then you contract this PEPs with increased bond dimension and then do uh, a truncation. But this would be computationally very expensive, and that's why I think it's not it's not so useful. It's a comparison between the uh, energy implementation and the minor time evolution. Uh, have you done the combination scheme with the uh, time evolution? No, I have not. I have not really. Uh, I have not really tried it out. So, or, or what do you mean by combination? You mean what I just said by the, the combination between the um, the, the, the calculated, the obtained the new wave function and the old wave function? Yeah. No, I have not tried that. So I don't know. But in the energy implementation scheme, you you have used the, the exactly this this thing exactly. But so again, if you do this combination, you then have to do a second energy minimization, which is also uh, expensive. So in the imaginary time evolution, you don't want to do that because it would really be expensive to to do this additional thing. Because in the imaginary time evolution, we have to do thousands of steps, whereas That's in the variational, of, you see, it, it would be uh, not very meaningful in the end to. Okay. All right. So, uh, and then final remark again. So, I think the, the optimal performance will really be by a combination of methods. So, so, a simple update might help you to get, get a good initial state, and then you can just add uh, a few steps <coughs> with a racial optimization, or you can do, for example, a full update with a large tau, right, which is also not so expensive to get a good initial state and to. Uh, variation optimization later, so there's it's really many things you can play around with uh, to get the most optimal um, uh, method. Okay, just last remark is that here I showed the one-side optimization, but of course you can also do a two-side optimization as in the MRG, where you optimize two tenses at once, and that's for example useful if you want to increase the bond dimension in a, in a dynamical way uh, also, when you have symmetries, for example, but I will not, uh, I will not go into the details. Okay, so with this, we have really uh, discussed all these uh, three steps here, um, and this will then bring me to the next uh, part where I would like to discuss and make a few remarks about the computational cost. All right, so we have um, a computational cost which is polynomial, so it's d to the power of k with a k which is 3 in the NPS case, but in the PEPS case it's uh, roughly 10. So it's a polynomial scaling, but really with a, with a large exponent. Right? So some people think that this is even tells you that this is useless, but uh, that's of course uh, that's, that's not really true. Uh, I mean, one way to uh, see it as well, the variational parameters in the end also increase very rapidly uh, as a, as a function of bond dimension, right? So the number of variational parameters increases with d to the power of 4. So the computational cost as a function of variational parameters does not uh, look so bad uh, anymore. So 2.5 compared to 1.5 in the NPS case. And then, the, I mean, the, the true question is how large does the d have to be? And of course, this really depends on the system, uh, about the amount of entanglement in the system. And I will come back to this uh, in a minute. But first, I would like to uh, discuss again a bit 
the difference between MPS and, and PEPs, right? We have this small power here, k equals to 3 in the MPS case, but remember if we do a 2D system, then we also have this exponential scaling of the bond dimension with uh, the width of the system, right? Which really means that this is accurate for cylinders up to a certain width, but beyond that, this exponential scaling will really become uh, problematic. So in the end, there's really going to be a crossover uh, between uh, matrix product states and two-dimensional tensor networks. So depending on the system size in 2D, uh, one or the other might be, might be favorable. And just to give you one idea, let me show you this slide, which actually Tao Shang also showed yesterday, but I can uh, show you here now also the improved result with IPEPs for D equals 6. So that's the uh, energy accuracy per side for the 2D Heisenberg model. Uh, that's DMRG calculations for different uh, cylinder widths, for different uh, bond dimensions here. And then what you can see here that the IPEPs D equals 6 is comparable to this point here. So that's uh, a width 10 cylinder with uh, 3,000 states here. Okay, so we get uh, a similar accuracy in these two cases. But of course the comparison is not, uh, is not uh, fully accurate because here we uh, compare the accuracy for an infinite size system to an accuracy on a finite cylinder, right? So I mean, again, we should also compare the accuracy on a, on a finite cylinder. But it gives you an idea. And in the end, what I find very remarkable is to compare the number of variational parameters in the two calculations, right? Which is of the order of 2,600 in the PEPs calculation versus roughly 18 million for the DMRG calculations. And this is per tensor. So in the DMRG calculations, they used like 200 tensors, and this is, these are two tensors. So in the end, these are, in the end, uh, right, it's so four orders of magnitude difference per tensor or six orders of magnitude difference in variational parameters uh, in total. Have you tried to put the PEPs of the final cylinder and compute the energy? Uh, not yet, but this is something we're, uh, we're working on now. So in the end, it, it really illustrates that this is a much uh, more compact uh, representation of a 2D <coughs> wave function, and that's in the end. Uh, I mean, it reflects the fact that this is uh, also kind of a, a brute force calculation. But in the end, the message uh, that I want to tell here is that I think one should really see the two methods as complementary, right? Because uh, the 2D DMRG really gives you very accurate results on cylinders up to a certain uh, width, Whereas with IPEPs, you really come from another limit. So you come from the infinite limit, um, uh, but you don't get usually the same precision as the MRG on the, on the smaller cylinders. So I think it's really, uh, they really should be seen as complementary and they can give uh, complementary information about the physics. So here's a, another example of a comparison for the, for the Kagome Heisenberg model. So that's a, a plot from uh, a paper by Steve White with different uh, results here, where I just su superimpose the IPEPs results. So this is just a simple update uh, calculation. And then the energy we obtain here is again comparable to width 10 cylinder with, uh, with 6,000 uh, states. Um, so for, but again, that's finite width cylinder compared to an infinite system. But in the end, this gives a bit of an idea of where this crossover actually happens between 2D tensor networks and 2D DMRG. Okay, so let me come back to this question, how large does the D have to be so that it depends on the amount of entanglement in the system? And uh, roughly, we can classify systems according to their uh, amount of entanglement in the following way. So usually, gap systems are, have a low entanglement so including uh, band insulators or balanced bond crystals and so on. Then there exist um, gapless systems in two dimensions which still have an area law uh, of the entanglement entropy that includes the Heisenberg model or also uh, superconducting <coughs> states which have uh, point nodes or, or Dirac fermions on a honeycomb lattice for example. And then the hardest cases are the systems which violate the air alone two dimensions, so which have a logarithmic correction to the air alone. And the 
most prominent example here are just free fermions, right? So it sounds a bit funny that free fermions, which are exactly solvable, are in the end extremely hard to simulate with a real space two-dimensional intense network ensembles. Right? So let me just show you some. It's actually very old IPEPS data, but it illustrates nicely um, this this, uh, this difference. Uh, so that's a, a model of free spinless fermions, which can be exactly solved. So lambda is a chemical potential and gamma is a, is a pairing potential. And here's the phase diagram. So we have these three different regions. Here we have a gapped region. Here we have a critical region, but which still has an area low. And then here on this uh, red line, we have a, a 1D Fermi surface. <coughs> and then here you see the relative error of the energy as a function of this uh, lambda parameter here. So we uh, go from left to right here. And then also for different values of gamma and uh, bond dimensions. And then you can see here, if you look at the black curve, if we are in the gapped phase, we really obtain a very high accuracy. And then we go to the critical phase where the uh, accuracy is, is reduced, but still it, it, it looks, uh, uh, still get an item and still reasonable accuracy. But then the worst thing is really here the red one. So with a 1D Fermi surface, we don't obtain a high accuracy. And you also see that going from D equals 2 to D equals 4 really does not improve uh, the results by much. Right? Okay, so really get a fast convergence with the gapped phases, but a very slow convergence in a phase which has a 1D Fermi surface. Okay, so this is kind of an illustration of these uh, different uh, regimes in one single model. Now, I would like to discuss also a bit about uh, um, order parameters. So take, for example, uh, the Heisenberg model again. And then if you look at quantum Monte Carlo data for the order parameter, so the stagger magnetization, you can see here the data from this uh, state-of-the-art paper by Sandek and Everts. You can see by extrapolating this data to the thermodynamic limits, they can obtain an extremely precise result for the stagger magnetization. But in the end, you also see that there are quite strong finite size effects here. Right? Now, in IPEPS, we don't have finite size effects, but strong finite D effects instead. Right? So here, you see the same order parameter, but plotted as a function of 1 over D. So you see we approach the exact result. But the problem is we don't have a nice smooth curve as on this side. So it's, it's not really clear how we should extrapolate this data. I mean, we can you know, try to fit uh, something here, and then we can get an estimate with a relative error of maybe a few percents here. OK. But nevertheless, even based on these crude approximations, um, it's still possible, for example, to distinguish an ordered phase from a disordered one. Uh, and I would like to show you a, an example to illustrate this, uh, namely a, a modified Heisenberg model where we have two different types of bonds. So we have these green bonds here, and then we have the blue bonds. And for the blue bonds, we can adjust the strength with this uh, coupling parameter J here. Right? So if J is equal to zero, we are just left with these green bonds here. And in that case, we would just have a, a product of uh, decoupled singlets, right? so a dimer phase. If j is equals to 1, then we are back to the original Heisenberg model, so where we know that we have a, a, a nil order. And now in between, it has been shown by quantum Monte Carlo simulations that there is a second order phase transition for this particular value, so separating this dimer phase uh, from this nil phase. And the question is now, what do we obtain uh, with IPEPs close to the second order phase transition? If we take a value in the ordered phase, but close to the phase transition, then uh, this is what we obtain here. So that's for j equals to 0.4. You see the order parameter gets strongly suppressed, but we can again try to do different uh, extrapolations here. And we obtain something which is in reasonable agreement with the Monte Carlo data. Then if we take uh, J exactly at the critical point, then it's not 
really conclusive. I mean, we extrapolate and some of the lines are above uh, a finite m and some of them vanish. So it's around uh, n equals to zero. But then if we go slightly below the critical points, then you see that uh, things seem to extrapolate to uh, m equals to uh, zero. So it vanishes even before d is uh, infinite. Now, but you also see that here the extrapolation is actually important, right? If we would take our last d value here, then we would actually predict still an ordered phase, right? Which is not correct. So it's important if you want to distinguish between the ordered and disordered phase, it's really important to look at how order parameters behave as a, as a, as a, as a function of the bond dimension. Uh, why, why does it look like a linear? Ex linear yeah, so this is, you see, this is, uh, that's an example, and it's not understood yet how the order parameters should actually behave as a function of the bond dimension. Right, so this is observation. And of course, in the end, the goal is really that we can do a finite bond dimension analysis in a very similar way as in a finite size scaling analysis in Monte Carlo simulations. And actually a lot of progress has been made in one dimension based on matrix product state, so Luca has uh, been working on this quite a lot, uh, where you really have the theoretical understanding how things should scale as a function of the bond dimension, so you can really, really come up with a finite bond dimension scaling ansatz to study uh, critical points, critical exponents, and so on. And that's, of course, the final goal as well uh, to do in two dimensions. But uh, let's say we are still, uh, we're still not there yet. Have, have you plotted that as a function of n as variance? Uh, not, not in this case. Uh, it's actually difficult to compute the variance of the energy. But there's now a new way also, based on this new framework, uh, from Frank's group that you can actually compute the variance of the energy and we tested that for the Heisenberg model but actually the, the energies were still scattered so we were not in a nice linear regime where you could extrapolate the energy and for order parameters we have not... Uh, we have not but energy it. can be scattered but in principle you can calculate the variance and what happens if you plot the magnetization as a function of the variance? So, but you're saying the variance of the of the energy, or the, okay? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what what we obtain in this case. Yeah, interesting uh, to look at. Why not do the if, why not do the extrapolation with regard to the uh, some kind of transition? That's right. Exactly. So this, of course, that uh, was also one of the ideas. Uh, so that's uh, so. Uh, Right, that's, that's the thing here which I mentioned already on, on Monday that you can define a truncation error and do extrapolation as a func function of this truncation error and then you can really do much nicer extrapolations of the energy uh, than if you would do an extrapolation as a function of uh, 1 over d. But uh, so far uh, for order parameters I, I made a few tests and somehow it did not, uh, it did not work out uh, in the same sense because in the end this truncation error is really uh, related to the Hamiltonian itself, and that's maybe the reason why it works well. But for all the parameters, it did not. Uh, this did not help improve. Yeah. So it might be a very naive question, but how do you justify the one over d extrapolation in the first place? Uh, not. I, I don't. Uh, so this is a kind of empirical observation, um, let's say. So I'm not. Uh, there's no uh, theoretical understanding of that, but it's in the end the observation that, and uh, in the end it's also natural to understand also based on what has been observed in, in, in MPS that you can have finite D effects very similar to finite size effects. So that's why you, you should be very careful when trying to distinguish an ordered phase from a disordered one. And of course if we get an extrapolation where you have a very small order parameter here, then of course things become tricky and we can't uh, be really sure. But let's say they're, they're quite clear cases, I would call this a rather clear case, and then uh, other cases where this is also rather small here, but I mean, if, you, if it reasonably extrapolates to a, a rather large order parameter, then we're, we're pretty on the safe side. Okay, so yes, I talked about this already on Monday, so that we can define a, a truncation error within the imaginary time evolution algorithm and then use this truncation error to perform extrapolations and just uh, to explain how the truncation error can be computed 
So in the end, uh, it's computed within the full update, right? So that's this cost function which we minimized before. And in the end, the, the truncation error is this cost function simply divided by tau <laughs> the imaginary time step. So that's this, uh, that's this W here. And here's another a benchmark for the Hubble model for U over T at half filling. So where we did this extrapolation here as a function of the truncation error, getting uh, this value here. Here's the exact uh, quantum Monte Carlo result, but here's also a media error bar on the quantum Monte Carlo result. It's also quite large here. And that's data from other methods. So D M T uh, having quite a large error bar. The D M G result, which is actually a bit higher, uh, so it's our results in between the Monte Carlo result and the DMRG result. And then if you look at fixed low Monte Carlo, you would actually get something which is, uh, which is too high. Okay, uh, so again, I mean, the final goal of these uh, energy extrapolations is then really for the case where you have strong competition between different states, as in the Hubbard model. But I talked about this already a moment. Okay, final remark. Uh, so this yep. truncation error destination is only for full update? Uh, well, you, you might also get, you, you see, in the end, there's also no, uh, I, can, I can't give you the analytic behavior of this thing, right? So in the end, uh, this, this gives you, can give you an improved way how to do an energy extrapolation, mm -hmm. and might, maybe it also, you get maybe also something in the simple update, but probably not. It, it's tricky, right? Because the simple update will converge to the wrong result, so probably also taking the extrapolated value will, in the simple update context, will not give you something very accurate. How about the variation update? Uh, there, yeah, so there you can do something similar. I don't have much data yet. Okay. And of, so also, there you could also do a truncation error from a two-side optimization. Okay. That could also be an option, but again, uh, so in the end, in the end, it's good if you, if you can get an estimate of the energy in different ways and see if things are actually consistent. Okay, uh, just final remark. Of course, it's important to exploit abelian symmetries. This always helps you to improve the performance of the calculations. So, uh, when there is uh, in the presence of the symmetries, the tensors can be written in the block form, and by uh, uh, exploiting this block form, you can really get a, a big speed up uh, in, in the computation time. And of course, implementing this uh, can be tedious, so it's best to use one of the existing libraries like the Uni10 uh, library, also iTensor, or the, these libraries which are around uh, for, for using Synergy. Okay, so, oh, let, let me see, now it's, uh, wow, time is advanced. So, uh, so I think I will I will just then go to the to some concluding remarks. Like this, right? So um, so I showed you a couple of examples already. So I, the last part I would have shown you more examples on SU and Heisenberg models where uh, IPEPS was also very useful to study the, the ground states. So in the, in the end, I think, uh, or at least I hope I was able to convince you that already today, uh, IPEPS or 2D tensor networks in general are really very uh, useful methods. But I think, uh, I really believe we're still kind of at the beginning. I think there's really uh, many more ways how we can actually improve these methods and even get higher accuracy. And for me, this is very exciting also given the fact or given the accuracy we have already reached uh, today, right? So there are different ways how we can improve uh, these methods. So I mentioned symmetries already, but we can also go beyond abelian symmetries and, and implement non-abelian symmetries. Um, there have been several works on combining 2D tensor networks with Monte Carlo sampling, which can also reduce the computational cost uh, for the contraction. There's different ways how to parallelize uh, 2D tensor network codes. So that's kind of also the next step if you want to go towards high performance uh, simulations of 2D tensor network algorithms. Um, then I told, we discussed a lot about optimization and contraction algorithms. 
And again, I think we're not at the end there, so there's really more things we should explore and try to optimize. Especially one important point is to get a better understanding, uh, more systematic analysis of fine ID uh, scaling analysis, so how can you really get accurate order parameters based on your fine ID uh, data. And I think that's something which you should really invest time. And then another very interesting direction is our combinations of methods like combining tensor networks uh, with uh, variational wave functions, for example, or with fixed norm Monte Carlo, and we heard a nice talk uh, on Monday about, uh, about this idea as well. So there have been uh, already works in that uh, direction. And of course, we talked here about ground state methods, but of course, we want to also go beyond ground state calculations, like, for example, uh, the computation of excitation spectra. And again, here there has been uh, a very interesting progress in uh, Frank Festrata's group based on these uh, channel environment frameworks where they can come up with an excitation ansatz uh, to compute excitations in 2D. So that's, uh, I think that's very exciting. Also finite temperature calculations uh, we can of course do, has already been tried out a bit. Real-time evolution is of course anyway challenging, so but that would be interesting to explore more. Continuous space, or extensions to continuous space, and I think uh, the time would also be right to really do more 3D calculations, or even for 3D uh, quantum. Okay, so with this I'm at the end. So I think uh, everyone agrees that 1D tensor networks has been the state of the art for many years. 2D tensor networks are more challenging, but I think there has been a lot of progress in recent years. So it has uh, become really a competitive variational method and it can be used to study uh, challenging problems. So I emphasize that there's still big room for improvement. So, that's, uh, so to me it's really, uh, that's why it's an exciting time to work in this field. And with this I would like to thank you for your attention. So if you assume some size of the unit cell mm -hmm. by assuming some transformation symmetry. Yes, right. And uh, my interest is uh, what is the accuracy when you increase the uh, size of unit cell? And suppose the eventually the true ground state is just a truly uh, transformation symmetry mm -hmm. state. And in, in that case, if you increase the size of the unit cells, uh, with the same computational cost, uh, do they give the same result with the just one unit cell, one one side in the unit cell case? So in the end, if you um, so there are two things. In the end, you should obtain. So for example, if you take a nil state, then uh, you should get the same result by taking a b pattern than if you take uh, something larger, right? Because the a b pattern just can be put into a larger unit yeah. cell. So you obtain the same. Yeah, but the, the computational cost increases. It increases, exactly. So, so you would so try to use a small unit cell size as possible. Yeah, but if you could do, if you do that with the same computational cost, mm -hmm. you, can, you can take the smaller dimension of D for the larger unit cells, for instance. Uh, no, not, not necessarily. So you would need the mm -hmm. same bond dimension for the large unit cell yeah, yeah. as for the but small but unit cell. But if you increase the unit cell size, then the computational cost increases. Yeah, linearly with the unit cell size, yes. So, and, yeah? And uh, the, the question is, suppose you have very strongly flu uh, fluctuating uh, long period structures. Yes. And uh, if it is, suppose it is not clear whether it is in the long period structure state or just uh, uh, one unit cell or mm -hmm. a small period. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if you take the larger uh, unit cells, then uh, I suppose that the accuracy becomes in principle worse than the calculation for the smaller unit cell calculations. Um, why? Uh, because uh, the, the, the computational cost increases, so within that allowed 
the computational cost. Yeah, that's right. But of course, we would the, the simulation time for a large unit cell would just take longer than for the small unit cell, right? I mean, we want to make sure that both unit cells would have been would have converged, for example, in the energy, right? So in the end, uh, it's clear that for the same computation time, um, so the, the large unit cells just take a longer computation time to get to the result. But once both have converged, you can it should so be so able suppose to you have a you have a strongly fluctuating mm -hmm. uh, ground state of the uh, long period. Uh, so but but T or steam or whatever, mm -hmm. and then. Uh, do you eat the same accuracy with the same uh, bond dimension for the large unit cells and the small unit cell if the ground state has the eventually the, the uh, translation symmetry? So you, you're talking about uh, a state which does not break translational symmetry but which might artificially break translational symmetry uh, for a sm small bond dimension. It's probably so in the sense that, right? So what if the bond dimension is too small? Then in principle you can get an artificial uh, translational symmetry breaking. So take for example the stripes, right? Which is really a translational symmetry broken state. I mean one possibility is that translational symmetry is going to be eventually restored if you take the bond dimension uh, very large, so that the translational symmetry breaking pattern we see only reflects the, the, the short-range uh, physics in the end. And another way of asking the question is, suppose the, the ground state is translationally symmetric. And then if you take a larger unit cell, uh, you will get some ground state energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you compare that energy with the case with the small unit cell calculations, should it be the same? It should be the same, yes. Even when the, the, the fluctuation is somehow approaching critical. Yeah, because in the end, the unit cell size does not tell you anything about the correlation length in the system. Mm -hmm. So you can reproduce the same correlation length yeah. for a small unit cell as for a large unit cell. Yeah, but my, my question is mm -hmm. whether the, by increasing the unit cell size, uh, should it be the same as the small unit size for the same D? Yes, it should be, it should be the same. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, th th there's a but because it might be that in this larger unit cell, you, 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 you well, <laughs> it's, it's a bit tricky to say. So eventually you should, you should obtain the same, but you can, if you are at small bond dimension, then it might be that in the large unit cell, you get some artificial symmetry breaking. And in that case, this might lower. Yeah, well, but just compare. So the entanglement. So, but, but in that case. So to 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 make to to answer your question in a different way, if you take your tensor A from your small unit cell and you would construct a, a larger unit cell with several copies of A, then you would really have the same exactly the of same course. result. Yes. Of course. But. Uh, and if you obtain the same state, so. Uh, it's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit tricky. But, but generically, for for a neo state, there's no reason to use a large unit cell if it fits in a smaller unit cell. I mean, that's in the end the, the point. In one previous uh, slides, mm -hmm. you cost just has some exponent two point five. Yes. How do you get that number two point five? So that was. Uh, the, the cost as a function of variational parameters. Yeah. Because the number <coughs> of variational parameters scales as d to the power of 4. Right? So if you take the computational cost of d to the power of 10, expressed as a function of the number of variational parameters, you get the exponent uh, 2.5. So yeah. Are the 10, well, I mean, uh, 10 is the usual scaling of the the d to the 10 would be the usual scaling of the, um, so d to the power of 10 would be the typical scaling of the contraction method of the CTM. Uh, no, so it depends on what you, uh, how, how you, how you do it. So, 
because you can always use some uh, smart algorithm to reduce that number. But generally, I mean, uh, a general algorithm. So if you take the, the symmetric, if you take the symmetric version, then it's clearly d to the power of 10. And then if you take the asymmetric version, what I showed yesterday was d to the 12, but you can also bring it down to, uh, to d to the 10 as we discussed yesterday. So, uh, so in the end, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, so anyway, I, I mean, in the end, it's, it's roughly d to the 10, right? Because you have a, a dependence on chi, and chi scales roughly as d squared. Um, so there's, there's anyway some, some other thing. <coughs> And more questions? Yeah. Yeah. In VMR, the super Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian, gives uh, a rough estimation of the gap uh, in the of the excitation. So in your case, in generally, uh, in your general eigenvalue problem, yes, right. have you observed the second largest eigenvalue? Exactly. So you can compute the second largest eigenvalue, which should give you some information about the gap or if you're in a gap system or not, yes. For example, if you take a gapless system, you would observe that this gap, of course, is also decreasing uh, with, uh, with bond dimension. And that is only the rough estimation, so... I the rough estimation. Yeah, once you have uh, the correct value, it might be once you obtain the correct ground state uh, tensor, and after that, you replace one of the tensors as rank plus, rank plus repetitive and do the calculation. But is it possible to implement such a variational uh, state with finite momentum in your CTM uh, method? Yes, so in the end, uh, no. So if you want to do an excitation ansatz, that was uh, the work uh, in, in Frank's group, to yeah. optimize this, you have a triple sum. Ah, I see, I see. You have a triple sum because you have a sum over momenta in the ket, a sum over momenta in the bra, and then you want to have a sum over the Hamiltonian terms. I and see. this I can't do here, right? Because in the end I only have a double sum here. I see, I see. So if you want to do an optimization of an excitation ansatz, you need this channel environment uh, framework. Okay, thank you. Mm. I just want to confirm that uh, a two dimensional Hamiltonian can be Exactly as a pilot. Yes, yeah. For example, Yes, right. So to add it with top range Yes, right. So there, there has been a paper even on, on how to include long ranged interactions in a pet pole. So how to construct this in a systematic way. But for example, for Heisenberg uh, Hamiltonian, you, you can get away with a pet pole dimension of uh, five, uh, I think, or something. So, but in the end, so I also try to do the variational optimization based on the PEPO, but in the end you have to contract this three layer thing, so the, this additional bond dimension of the PEPO will intervene as a factor in your CTM scheme, for example, and this is, I mean, it's the same scaling of the computational cost, but there's quite a large factor between the PEPO version and, and what, I, what I do here. Um, but uh, the advantage is that, of course, you can then include any type of interactions in your PEPO and always use the same algorithm uh, to do an energy minimization. So that's also nice about using a PEPO for that. Yes? I have another question. About the, uh, your general eigenvalue problem, mm -hmm. uh, both denominator and numerator, especially uh, denominator, uh, that, uh, it, is not, uh, it is not easy to uh, prove the positivity of the denominator. So the denominator might contain small negative eigenvalue. Uh, so the, the matrix appears, the, yeah. the denominator might contain some uh, negative eigenvalue. In that case, the deviation goes to the direction where your denominator shrinks to zero. Uh, so there is a, such a danger, but uh, I ask you whether you encounter such a dangerous situation or not. Uh, uh not, not that I know of. Uh, of course, you can always uh, solve this problem, right? By uh, by representing and I mean throwing away the negative uh, single values, right? So that's a, a way to get a, a get around it. But I don't. Uh, I think I did not observe that. But it's it's a good question. I should look into this in more detail. Yeah. Thank you.
Just okay, a yeah. question: When you uh, when you sum up these Hamiltonian terms in your CTM scheme, you said you you also after every step you have to sort of renormalize your tensor such that the numbers are bound. But I was wondering, don't you then have kind of different energy scales? That so you're adding what to? so what you have to if you do that? So I, um, if you divide a tensor C one, for example, by a certain number, then you should also divide the same C one tilde by the same number. So you're saying so if you because do of taking a ratio at the end, you keep track of the different scales that you are creating. Th that's right. So in the end, you want to have, uh, well, let me see. If you look at this diagram here, if you compare the two here, then they should have the same normalization constant, meaning that if you divide this thing by something, you should also divide this C1 tilde by the same number. I mean, this is mm. for, for, for consistency in the end. Yeah, but if you, I mean, you, you keep growing this thing, no? Mm -hmm. So you're trying to approximate, it's not just really one network that you're trying to, to make bigger it's and bigger, sum, like it's one single partition function, but it's really a sum of very many terms. So you're explicitly calculating sums of something. That's right, yeah. So when you then divide by a number, the different contributions at different that iteration times have different weights. So. No, in the end, you can you can convince yourself that uh, the weights of all okay. these contributions should be, should be yes. <laughs> so, so this is not a, a global, I mean, global number that you divide, or is it just for C one and C one kilo? It's the same number yeah. that you divide. It's it's the same number that I divide. Yes. So it's not a say for I get I get a T one and T one kilo. This is. It's also divided number from the, C1. No, 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 this is, uh, I, I use, uh, I use another number. Uh, okay, so, so, each, so, so basically, you can, you can, yeah, so in the end, you just want to make sure that these are kind of equivalently uh, normalized. And you can, of course, you can always check for consistency by switching off these normalization constants and see that you get the same result. Yeah? Because the normalization constants, you only need them if you really do many, many iterations, and uh, that's, Okay. No more questions. Okay. Okay.